before we start working with the numerical calculations portion of our course, we need to take a section, section 1.1, to figure out a whole bunch of definitions. That way we have a common language and a way of viewing the numbers that we're going to be looking at. So the first thing we need to do is establish what statistics is. So statistics is the area of mathematics that is involved with the collection, summary, classification, and presentation of data that has been collected. And that's a lot to kind of think about, but the key to this is the data that has been collected. So there are a lot of things in this world that we collect data on. Uh, sports teams, uh, your car, and patients in a hospital. So when you're a patient in a hospital and the nurse comes in every couple hours and checks your blood pressure, they are collecting data on you. When you drive your car into the dealership and they check your numbers and check your odometer and check your air pressure and your tires, they're collecting data on that car. When you go to a baseball game and you look up at the scoreboard and it's full of numbers, they're collecting data on every player, on every team, on every game. Right? All of that is data that is being collected. The census, the U.S. government collects data on or tries to collect data on every single person that lives in the country. So that way they can figure out, you know, hey, which areas need more help here? Which areas need more help there, etc. Right? That is... Um, the data that's being collected and statistics is the mathematics that involves analyzing all of that, right? So not only do we collect it and summarize it, but we have to figure out, you know, hey, how can we present this so people understand what they're looking at? How could we um, classify this so we could figure out, you know, hey, this belongs into this group and this belongs into this other group, right? So that's statistics. It's the study, the mathematical study of those numbers, because it's not enough just to gather the numbers. You have to gather them and then do something with them. And there are two main things that we do with them, quote unquote. That is descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Now, descriptive statistics, um, that involves usually one of two things. So you want um, a graphical summary. So you're going to summarize them in a graph form, like a table or a chart, right? Or you're going to numerically summarize them. So graphical summaries, most people know and have seen, like a pie chart or a bar chart that kind of thing. Um, you could also just make a big table that has everything organized. That works. That's describing what's going on, but in a table. Um, graphs, of course, are very powerful because they allow you to see some very complex numbers in a very simple way. The danger with that, of course, is if it's too simple or if it's not truly representative of what's happening, which we'll talk more about in chapter two. Um, the numerical measures, you think, oh, I don't know what those are. Yeah, absolutely, you do. So as a student, when you get a test back in a class, the first thing that comes out of your mouth, because I've been an instructor for a long time, is the student saying, hey, what was the average? Why do you want to know that? Well, because an average is a numerical summary of the group. If you know what the class's average is, you know vaguely how that class looked. So a class that has an average of 80% is a very different world than a class that has an average of 50%, right? Well, we'd much rather be in the first class rather than the second. Now, descriptive statistics organizing data, gathering data like this. This has been going on for a very, very, very long time. Um, for example, the census. So the census, of course, the U.S. has a census, but it dates back to Roman times, if not earlier. We have written record in the Bible, for example, of the census is taking place in Roman times, hence the need for Joseph and Mary to travel to Bethlehem to be counted, quote unquote, right? Um, we also have records of um, the Chinese government back in, you know, BC times taking uh, data on their people. So this has been going on for a very, very long time. The Egyptians also gathered data on their people and have kept records of those things. The Romans were particularly good about it. Um, so the another um, time that we've seen uh, graphs come into four. So the, the whole graphing thing, making pie charts and all of that, those were actually a later invention. Um, Romans, when they took the census and Middle Ages, when they would take data on taxation and, and gather it at the governments, they would just kind of keep it in tables and that's about it. But actually using graphs to show what was going on is a more recent invention. One of the most famous people to popularize them was actually Florence Nightingale. Most people know of her as being a nurse. Um, if you know a little bit more about her, you know she was a British nurse during the Crimean War in 1858, right? But she actually used graphs, one of the first people to use graphs to prove that sanitation was important, i.e. cleanliness in a hospital. Um, that was a, that's a very recent phenomenon because they didn't know about germs, they didn't know about bacteria. 
um, in the Middle Ages, for example. So they didn't realize that, hey, maybe you should clean things with soap and, and hot, hot water before you use them on another patient. She was the one that figured those things out. Um, and she made pie charts and um, bar charts to show this. And she was the first person to do so. And it took a long time for the men that were in charge of the hospitals to listen to her. But she was absolutely right. And she was able to show that with descriptive statistics, namely graphical um, statistics. So she was able to show in picture form what was happening. All right, inferential statistics is a much later phenomenon that's only been around really since the 1800s or so. And that's when we use the statistics that we have from the descriptive portion. So we gathered the data and then we described it. And then we use that to make inferences, to make decisions about what should be done. Right. And these are not decisions like, oh, I feel in my gut that we should go this way. No, no, no. It's decisions based on the data. So the data is showing this particular trend. Is this a significant trend or not? If it's significant, then we can make a decision based on that. Right. So this kind of happens all the time with drug trials, for example. So if a drug company comes up with a new drug or a new drug concoction that they think will, um, I don't know, uh, lower weight for people. It's not enough to lower it perhaps by, you know, a pound. Maybe that's not significant. They need it to be significant and they have to run inferential statistics and analysis on it to make sure that's significant before they can approve it. They should also probably make sure not only is it um, ethical, but, but um, reasonable cost and it has a, a large benefit to the population before they start approving drugs willy nilly, but that's a whole nother discussion. All right. So that's inferential statistics. It's when you take the data and make an informed decision. And there, there's a little bit more formality to that than I'm getting into, but we will discuss that in later chapters. So the first few chapters of the course are descriptive statistics. So we're going to talk about um, charts in chapter two and then chapter three and four. It's more numerical summaries and um, some scatter plots and things like that. And then in chapters 8 through 13, that's all inferential statistics, making those big, difficult decisions, talking about the larger group. How does the large group compare to the small sample? Things like that. So that'll all be chapters 8 through 13. And if you're wondering, hey, wait a second, I'm, I'm no math major, but there's some char chapters in there that are missing, you would be right. Because you basically can't get to inferential statistics unless you know something about how the future works. Because inferential statistics is talking about, hey, how would we make predictions? How would we talk about the future? And there's one mathematical subject that deals with future, and that's called probability. So probability is chapters 5, 6, and 7, and a little bit of 8, quite frankly. So mathemat the mathematics of future predictions is probability, and then we use that mathematics and the data from chapters 2 through 4 and combine them together to do chapters 18, 8 through 13, which of course means the course gets progressively more complex. Not necessarily harder, it's just more complicated what's going on in later chapters because you're using all the probability stuff from chapters 5, 6, and 7 as well as the descriptive statistics from 2 and 3 and 4. Um, and if, like I was saying earlier, this whole inferential statistics thing, um, it's very, very popular. It's used in every business you can imagine right now. I mean, Google, for example, is a company that doesn't make a move without first analyzing it at great length um, numerically with inferential statistics. However, that's a very recent phenomenon. Um, it's only been around since the mid 1800s or so to late 1800s. They are, um, Carl Pearson and Ronald Fisher are two of the people that popularized it amongst others. So it's a much more recent phenomenon as opposed to descriptive statistics, just gathering and, and making tables out of data has been going on for a very, very, very long time. We have evidence of that in ancient China, ancient Rome, ancient Egypt, ancient um, Mesopotamia, that's been going on for forever. Well, not forever, but for a very long time. All right, so let's read here. A historian wants to estimate the average age of marriage at marriage for women in New, York, New England in the early 19th century. Okay, so at what age did women get married at their first marriage in the early 19th century? Within her state archives, she finds marriage records for the years 1800 to 1820. She takes a random sample of those records and finds that the average age of the brides in the sample is 24.1 years. She then finds a margin of error and estimates that the average age of brides for the population was between 23.5 and 24.7 years. All right, so what part of the study is descriptive and what part of the study is inferential? So the part of it that, that's descriptive is this part right here. When she takes the random sample and finds that the average age of the brides in the sample is 24.1 years. 
that is descriptive. It is describing exactly what she found, right? So in her sample, that's what she got. She got the average age to be 24.1 years. So then from there, she needs to make a prediction about what she thinks. She didn't look at every single record. And quite frankly, she's only looking at this one state, right? So from 1800 to 1820. So what about the other states around there? What about the people that weren't in those particular records? Say the records were lost or something. So she needs to infer from there about the larger group of women at, in that age group from 1800 to 1820. And that would be this part. So she finds the margin of error. We'll discuss what that means in chapter nine, as a matter of fact. But um, she estimates estimates that the average age for the brides of the population was between 23.5 and 24.7 years. So it's not 24.1. What she's saying is she thinks it's somewhere in that range, right? And that's a very important concept for the later chapters, chapters 8 through 13, when we deal with inferential statistics, you're not going to be as precise. So when you get the statistics, the actual um, from the sample, which is what this is, you can be really precise. You can say, hey, I took the sample, the average from that sample, 24.1 years done. But that's only the group that she took right? So, you know, if she had a random sample of, you know, 500 records or whatever, that's only those 500 brides. That's it. Right. But this, this pink part is when she's trying to talk about all of them, but she doesn't have all of them. So she's inferring from the sample to a larger group. And that means that she has to allow for some wiggle. Right. She knows it's not going to be exactly 24.1, but she thinks it should be close. And we'll talk about what that means all in chapter nine. Right. How what does should mean and how close is close enough and where does this margin of error thing come from? That's all chapter nine. All right, we're done with that example. I'll see you back here for the next video.